start the meeting, I'm just thrilled and overjoyed. I want to announce, cannot control myself. I want to announce this uh, news that we just heard this morning from the uh, IMLS um, in Washington, D.C. It is the Institute of Museum and uh, Library Services there today announced the six recipients of the 2021st National Medals for Museums and Library Services. And this is the nation's highest honor given to libraries and museums that uh, have made significant and exceptional contributions to their communities. And over the past 25 years, the award has celebrated institutions that are making a difference for individuals, families, and the communities. And I'm pleased to announce that Memphis Public Libraries is one of the final three libraries. Um, in the nation that won this honor. And uh, it's also, uh, our libraries is also the one only, uh, the only library ever, first ever, that has won twice of this medal, one in 2007, and this is 2021. So I'm very pleased. And uh, I want to uh, thank you, all of you, you participants and the program and Tom, you're the presenters for wonderful programs for providing services and programs. So when you see a library staff, make sure you go and congratulate for all the work they have been doing. We're so proud of Memphis community and we're so proud of the library too. Okay, so now we're going to start with our today's uh, Folks of Beyond. Um, let's see. Today, uh, we are so honored to have our guest speaker, Tom Walsh, and he's the father and also the author. Um, let me see some, what is making a lot of noise. Let me see if I can try to. Um, if you are not speaking, please mute yourself so we can. Okay. Okay, so um, I um, Tom is the author of the book called When Hope Overcame the Impossible, an epic story of a 13-year-old boy who refused the death sentence of brain can cancer. And we know that Memphis is famous for St. Jude, and we're so proud of St. Jude's Children's Hospital. And, um, and this book is very local to us, and uh, we all look forward to it uh, to to this uh, special talk and I also want to introduce uh, about the author Tom Walsh grew up in north central Kansas in a small farming community named Concordia calling the wheat fields of Kansas his boyhood home Tom was the oldest of seven boys and one year younger than his sister Margie at age 15, Tom's parents moved their large family of eight kids to Denver, Colorado, in search of more opportunities for their children. Upon graduation from high school, Tom attended college in Tulsa, Oklahoma, where he met his wife, Darcia. Deciding to plant their roots in the western suburb of Tulsa, Tom became, began his career teaching Spanish to junior high school age students. It will be only six years later when he made the transition to elementary school principal, where he would spend the remainder of his 30 year career. Tom retired after three decades in public education in the year 2020. It was also the time our country was thrust into COVID-19 pandemic. Although his immediate retirement plans were delayed, Tom began the process of writing his oldest son Isaac's health story to spread an awareness of pediatric cancer. Currently, Tom frequently volunteers at El Shalom Children's Orphanage and uh, Brenner School in San, San Diego, the Tusca, how, how to pronounce it, um, El Salvador. Relishing the opportunity to return to the classroom, Tom reconnects with his past by being a volunteer teacher to those less fortunate than him. He plans twice annual trips to see the orphan children who had referred him as the Padrino, 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 which is Spanish for Godfather. So, um. I'll just introduce to here and then Tom and go ahead and then, and then take away and then 
share with us of this wonderful story. Okay, and can we get the PowerPoint up so they can see the pictures, Wan Ying? Okay, I can. I'm going to uh, do the PowerPoint this second. Can y'all see? No. You cannot? No. Nobody can see? Yeah. Yes or no? Yeah, uh-huh. Yes. You can see it? Uh-huh. If oh. you go to slideshow up there at the top and then go to beginning. The only problem was if I go to the slideshow, somehow I cannot forward. Okay. Like this way I can go forward. But if I go to the slideshow, I cannot push forward. Okay, well, that's fine. I have some notes there for me, but that'll help me out too. Okay, can you see the notes? Everybody else can see the notes? Uh-huh. Okay, yeah. so yeah. we can only see this. So let's just do with this version then. Well, thank you, Wan Ying. It's, I, I've been to your group several times now. It's a real honor to be a part of it and even to be in Tulsa, Oklahoma and join you all in Memphis. I tell people I feel like Memphis is my second home. When we came there 10 years ago, I tell people we accepted an invitation to St. Jude, and it's an invitation no parent ever wants uh, when you have a child with cancer, but yet we felt wel welcomed by the doctors and nurses there, and in the entire community, we noticed to embrace the mission of the hospital. And I love to speak to groups in Memphis because Almost all of you have some connection to the hospital. I know Wang Ying does some translation there for Chinese families. A lot of people maybe have a, a daughter or a spouse or someone that works there, a friend or, or a friend or someone they know who works at the hospital, or maybe even know a child who was treated there. And I can't tell you the the support and the empathy we felt from those uh, the people in Memphis. I can remember one time. And numerous times, one of our favorite places to eat was the Blue Plate. And there's one downtown and one out at Mendenhall and Poplar. And we were in there eating and Isaac took off his hat and you could clear, he was bald and you could see the surgery scars. And when we went to leave the waitress, I asked for the check and she said, it's been taken care of. And I said, well, who took, who did it? And she said, well, they want to remain anonymous, but they want you to know that they're praying for you and they're thinking of you. And it was just acts of kindness like that that we felt all throughout Memphis that really reinforced in us the the embrace the people in Memphis have, uh, have for the hospital and just the warmth and the love that we felt. Uh, I, I tell people it's like my second home. I love coming to Memphis to visit. One thing I want to point out on the cover, if you look, I, I told the graphic artist who designed the cover, I wanted it to resemble someone emerging from an abyss longing to uh, see what is on the other side and so it's kind of hard to see but you see a person I, I i assume it's me because the person is bald and they're carrying a book but they're <laughs> looking at the campus of saint jude that's what they're longing for or wanting to see on the other side that's the symbolism in the cover and as wang ying mentioned you know when i retired i, I was talking with saint jude and i was going to uh, do some uh, speaking at their corporate events, I did a lot of that volunteer for the last 10 years, and I wanted to continue doing that. But of course, the pandemic locked the campus down and they're not bringing any groups on. But one, my two reasons in writing the book is I wanted to raise an awareness of pediatric cancer, that cancer can happen to kids in the infancy of life. Even kids that are small babies suffer from cancer. And secondly, and you'll see this throughout the book. I, I, I went back and I, we had a Cambridge journal and I read the, the notes that I wrote. I, I felt if I could convey my raw emotions and talk about all the members of my family and how we came to a journey of hope and healing, it would bring hope to those who are brokenhearted and healing to those who are, I say, emotionally bruised or whose lives have been changed forever by cancer. And the next slide you'll see uh, in slide two are our two children, Isaac and Caleb. I think Wan Ying's going there, yes. Uh, 
-hmm. Isaac is the redheaded one in front. Caleb is the one in the back. And we were your typical middle-class American family. We had two healthy, wonderful kids. Neither one of our kids were born with any type of birth defects or anything like that. But the story behind their birth is a miracle in and of itself because my wife and I, for eight years, we were not able to, uh, she wasn't able to conceive a child. And we even went to a fertility specialist who told us we would never be able to conceive a child on our own and that we would we would need fertility treatments. And back in the early 90s, 30 years ago, the success rate was only about 25%. And so like a lot of people, we gave up and thought, you know, the Lord's will be done. And then who knows, six months later, Daisha got pregnant with our first son, Isaac. And then two years later, our second son, Caleb, came along. And in the next slide, you see a picture of Isaac when he was a baby. And... The one thing that we didn't know that St. Jude would tell us later is when he was born, he had dormant brain cancer cells and it stored in his brain at birth. And so it wasn't that, you know, it was a genetic mutation of genes, but they were actually in his brain during birth. And, hmm. and of course, you know, but typically these cancer cells begin to grow in the form of a tumor before age eight. And in Isaac's case, it was age 13, which is a little bit older. Uh, but generally, they start growing before a child reaches eight years old. Unfortunately, we saw children at St. Jude as young as one years old or younger that had the same surgery scars and the same type of cancer that Isaac did. And their survival rate is much less because uh, just they're so small and the radiation can be very, very harmful. And the next picture, you I want to paint a picture of what our kids were like prior to cancer in slide three. You can see them here. I call it the milestones of childhood Halloween, especially in school where I was a principal. That was one of the favorite holidays of the year because of the candy. All the kids <laughs> love the candy and the costumes. And here you can see our two kids dressed up for Halloween. And in the next slide, you know, what was so shocking to a lot of people in Sepulpa where we live and our family members is we had two healthy kids that were the all stars of their soccer team. And you can see Caleb on the right, he's in a soccer jersey. Isaac's on the left, with sticking out his tongue. He's in his basketball jersey. And like a lot of parents these days, one of us went to soccer games, one went to basketball games. And But we had two normal, healthy kids. And I tell people, if you've ever watched like a little league soccer game, I call it swarm ball. Wherever the ball is, all the kids will swarm to the ball. And same thing in basketball. Whoever has the ball, it's like they, they're chasing somebody with a prize toy. And our kids were, they were very talented. You know, when that swarm of kids in soccer were after the ball, Isaac, the oldest one, or Caleb would always be one of the two that came out of that pile with the ball. They were very, very talented athletically. Believe me, they didn't get it from their dad. It wasn't me. But I, I'm trying to paint a picture uh, these were two normal, healthy children prior to cancer. And then in slide six, you can see a picture of myself, a uh, little bit younger probably in that photo, and my wife and my two kids there. And, um, and to look back and to think that he had cancer cells in his brain during this time, it, it's just almost unfathomable for me to think about. In the next picture, you can see uh, Isaac again, uh, in a gunny sack race, uh, he was really, you know, even at a young age, uh, the the high school basketball coaches were looking at him to be a varsity athlete. He was very, very talented athletically. And then you can see in slide eight, a picture of him. And these were pictures prior to him having cancer, uh, right before he was diagnosed. This was the summer before he was diagnosed. The next picture, Wan Ying. Is a, a good picture of him too, uh, somewhere at a ball game. He loves sports. But in the next picture, this was only two months prior to when he had cancer. And this was in November. The cancer started to grow in January. And what we didn't know, a lot of people ask, what were the signs and symptoms that your child had? And I think they asked because they themselves are maybe worried about their own children. Uh, you know, when your child complains of a headache, you don't assume it's cancer. When they have an ear infection, you don't suspect cancer. But when you have 
a large mass. If you go to the next slide, you can actually see the tumor called the medulloblastoma. You can clearly see the tumor in the middle of the brain. And when that tumor is growing, it, it causes pressure. And so we saw pressure-related symptoms like an ear infection from the, the tubes of the ears being swollen or even, you know, uh, uh, intermittent blurry vision because the optic nerves, as we'll see in the next slide here in a minute, connect in that area of the brain. And he had excruciating headaches and even held his head in an awkward way. This is a picture taken looking down, taken on March the 10th, 2011. You can see the two ears, the little lines off to the side, those are the ears. At the very top, you can see the nose, you can see the eyes as well. If you look right above the tumor, there is like a, a round dark circle with a, a dark uh, dot in the middle of it. That's the spinal cord. And that's important because this area of the brain in the second picture, you'll see the picture of the spinal cord in slide 12. You can clearly see the tumor uh, smashed up against the spinal cord and the tumor had actually grown around the spinal cord. And, you, and I'm not a doctor, but one of those lobes of the brain, I think it's the one that's pushing on towards the top is the cerebellum. And that controls fine motor skills, things like uh, you know, eating with a fork or even picking something up, you know, opening a can of pop, fine motor skills with your hands. It also con controls balance and movement. And so uh, when the tumor was removed, that was a concern. Also, uh, the area in which the, the tumor is found is also where the optic nerves connect to the brain. And so during surgery, it was a, a very serious concern about, you know, will he suffer permanent damage to his eyes because of the area of the tumor? Um, you know, I look at those pictures today and, and it was just so ominous when you, in the next slide, in slide 13, after having had surgery, if Wang Ying will uh, just, just, go on. Just sorry, I was trying to get somebody in and, I, and then I, well, I'll keep um, talking then. Yes, you keep Fine. talking. You know, when, you, when you're in the hospital, like my son Isaac is there, nothing in life prepares you. Uh, he's 13 years old. He's battling for his life. And nothing prepares you for a surgeon to come to you and say, you know, the surgery is going to be two parts. But you saw the picture of the tumor. And it was so massive. And so uh, the brain was so swollen. They said he was within probably a day of having a stroke and dying at age 13. And nothing prepares you for a surgeon to say, you know, that we have to literally drill a hole in the brain to relieve the pressure the tumor is causing before we can do another <laughs> surgery to remove it. And so I remember the day he was wheeled away for surgery, not thinking that we would ever see him again. And, and nothing, I tell people, there's not a YouTube video there's not a step sheet, there's not a book or anything that prepares you for that. I've lost my mother to cancer, my mother-in-law, but nothing prepared me to see my 13-year-old child almost taken you know, by cancer. We actually had two surgeries in Tulsa. One, the first one was extremely dangerous and he did survive. The surgeon told us when he, he drilled the hole and the, the hole penetrated the brain, the spinal fluid literally shot about three feet into the air in the operating room. It was that swollen. And then uh, it was amazing because all of a sudden it was like the pressure was all gone. He was back to normal. He was wanting to play his video games. But surgery number two, uh, and, the, and you can see here after surgery number two, that's where we realized the extent of the brain damage. Because in this picture here, you know, they went in and there's a scar on the back of his head about six inches long. And then they literally cut like a pumpkin top in the back of his head out of the bone and took out this massive softball sized tumor. And I remember when he came back to the room, the surgeon came before dawn and he told the nurses to put pillows and blankets in the windows to darken the room because he would have a severe sensitivity to light. And then he also told us to be, he would be a fall risk because of the balance. And then the fine motor skills. I remember 
he wanted to eat a popsicle. He, he, he woke up and he wanted the popsicle. He couldn't unwrap the popsicle. And then when I placed it in his hand, he grip, gripped it like a stick. And then he lifted it towards his ear. He couldn't find his mouth with the popsicle. And the surgeon told us, you know, that he's young enough that different lobes of his brain can relearn the skills that the cerebellum has lost because that part of the day, uh, brain was permanently damaged. And so Isaac actually went to a skilled rehabilitation center for a couple of weeks prior to going to Memphis where he had to relearn how to hold a spoon and how to hold a fork and really how to walk. His balance was very bad. He couldn't keep his balance. And so just like a stroke victim goes to a rehabilitation center to relearn some of those skills, Isaac was by far the youngest one in there. But he, he was bouncing a basketball down the hallway and different things. But a more pressing concern for us was cancer. And you'll see in the next slide, our arrival at St. Jude came in early April, about three weeks after uh, we, um, we had gone to Memphis. And you know, what I tell people here, you know, St. Jude is a special place. They treat, uh, to be admitted there, you don't go there if you have a broken leg or you're in an ATV accident. You go there when you meet the protocols of a research study being done on a type of cancer that's being studied, studied there. Or they also study some rare blood-borne diseases there. And we got in by, our surgeon came to us in Tulsa and said, you know, the tumor that we removed is malignant, it's cancerous, and, you know, and they told us, you know, if we had stayed in Tulsa, they gave us two options. They said if we stayed in Tulsa, it would be eight months of radiation, you know, a couple days on, four or five days off, and that would last for eight months. And it would leave his brain like a well-done burnt steak and lower his IQ by 30 points. And then they told us also that the chemotherapy would be three chemotherapy drugs administered through an IV that would cause permanent damage in his legs where he would never walk again. And it would also cause complete and total hearing loss. And I remember looking at the oncologist and saying, after 14 months of treatment, you know, over a year spent in the hospital, the best you can do is give me back my child in a wheelchair with no quality of life, severe brain damage, and no ability to hear. And she said, Mr. Walsh, this is the third worst case of cancer we've ever seen here. And she said, but there is another option. Actually, a research scientist from St. Jude had called and said, you meet the protocols of a research study being done at St. Jude. And going to St. Jude, she said, you know, that, uh, you know, what they would do there, it would be six weeks of radiation instead of six months. And also at St. Jude, it would be four experimental rounds of chemotherapy where they would take those three chemotherapy drugs that they would give in Tulsa and they would double the dose of those drugs. And because the toxicity would be so dangerous and to keep the body from failing, they would harvest bone or stem cells from Isaac's own bone marrow because his blood was not infected with cancer, it was a spinal fluid and give him those stem cells back to keep his organs from failing and to keep him alive. And so he actually went through four experimental rounds of chemotherapy in addition to the radiation that, not, that went not just to his brain, but also to his spine. The entire, anywhere in the body where there was spinal fluid was radiated to keep any uh, cancerous cells from breaking away. One thing, uh, I, most of you probably know, this is the most famous statue on the grounds of St. Jude. I've met a lot of people in Memphis that have never been to St. Jude because it's not like uh, the Med or St. Francis, one of those hospitals where you park and go in and visit someone. You have to have business there or know a patient to get in. But this is the most famous statue there. It's a statue of St. Jude Thaddeus. And, you know, part of the history of St. Jude, Danny Thomas was an entertainer early in life. And when he was uh, in, er, he was, his wife was uh, expecting children. They were expecting their first child. He went to church and he, he prayed to the patron saint, St. Jude Thaddeus, show me my way in life and I will build you a shrine. And soon thereafter, Danny Thomas became a household no name on radio, TV, television. And then he 
began the journey of uh, building a hospital in Memphis, which I'm told at the time was a small clinic um, and not the massive hospital that it is now. But in order to build this hospital, he started a group called ALSAC. Many of you may have heard of that. That stand, it stands for American Lebanese Syrian Associated Charities, which resembles the group of businessmen that met in Chicago in 1957 and pledged you know, to raise money for the hospital. And so today, uh, St. Jude has basically two parts. You have the medical side of the hospital, which St. Jude only has 68 beds at their hospital, whereas you know many hospitals have thousands of beds. And there's 5,000 people that work in the medical field at St. Jude to serve those 68 beds and also the numerous kids that come in on an inpa or outpatient basis to be treated. And then you have the ALSEC side, which is known as the fundraising and awareness arm of the hospital. And they're the ones that raise the money, that raise the awareness of St. Jude, that produce all the commercials on TV and the marketing. And I, I tell people, you know, we went to St. Jude and we didn't know it at the time, but all the medical bills were covered. We were not charged anything. Our medical bills over 10 years totaled $5 million. Our insurance company paid $2 million, but the other $3 million was uh, uh, what St. Jude never asked us to pay because of the generous giving and the support that people give the hospital. In the next picture, you see Isaac. This was after a surgery in Memphis where, uh, you know, I, I wrote in my notes here about the, um, excuse me, the, the treatment plan in Tulsa. And the survival rate, if we had stayed in Tulsa, was only 39%. The survival rate at Memphis was close to 80%. But one of the, the problems that we yeah. had is in Tulsa, the tumor had literally attached itself to the spinal cord. And the surgeon told us that Patrick, he the cut in, the to cut into okay. that, he could risk blindness, he could risk paralysis by damaging the spinal cord. But because he had tumor remained, it was going to cause the radiation rate to be very, very uh, high, okay. that would cause severe brain damage. And so at St. Jude, Isaac well, had I mean, surgery. I'm, just, I'm, I'm doing a podcast right now. I think uh, we're getting echoed. Yeah, if you don't want to park in the driveway, then you don't have to. Sure. Isaac had a surgery at St. Jude where uh, they they did this at Le bon or one of their kind of their sister hospital or partner hospital there. It's called an intraoperative MRI, where generally when you have an MRI or you have surgery, they wait two weeks and go back and image and take a picture of the soft tissue two weeks later. In this case, they were able to do an MRI during the middle of surgery. They did three of them, and each time the surgeon cut deeper and deeper into the spinal cord and removed every bit of the tumor. And as a result of that, they were able to lower the radiation grade and Isaac suffered no brain damage. In the next picture, you see our neuro-oncologist, Dr. Giles Robinson, the actual head of the, uh, the trial was a doctor from India, and this was his assistant, Dr. Robinson. What's interesting about Dr. Robinson, when Isaac had that tumor removed in Tulsa, on the second day, we signed consent paperwork and became a St. Jude patient. Even though we weren't in Memphis, the doctors in Memphis were telling the doctors in Tulsa what to do until we got there. And Dr. Robinson, what they requested was they wanted the tumor to be packed in dry ice and sent overnight by FedEx to St. Jude because he was conducting a molecular study of this type of cancer and looking at the molecular makeup, the DNA sequencing of the tumors. And as a result, when we went to Memphis, we joined 14 research studies where in these studies, everything from sleep adaptation to uh, school to psychology, but one of the studies was to look at Isaac's DNA and see what drugs would be best to give during treatment, what antibiotics would metabolize best with this system. And so every single drug given during treatment had already been pre-screened as a result of looking at his tumor tissues. That's how precise uh, the, uh, the research is at St. Jude and the treatment there. In the next slide, you can see a picture of Isaac after brain surgery. I tell people this was the most decisive of all Isaac's 21 surgeries. 
because it was in this surgery, they used the interoperative device, like I talked about earlier, to remove all the cancer, which lowered the radiation grade. And in the next picture, here's another picture of Isaac after that surgery. And you can see uh, the bandages on his, on his forehead, uh, the, the, link, the lines on his chest. But, you know, removing the, the, can the tumor was critical, removing all of the tumor, because then there was no tumor attached to the spinal cord. But you can't really see it really well in this picture. But what happened when they removed that tumor is they nicked, they cut the nerve that works the left side of the face. And so you'll see in the upcoming photos, one side of the face will go up when he smiles and one side of the face will stay down. My dad's, and Isaac, I wouldn't say this to him, but it's almost like Casper the ghost when he smiles because of that. And as a teenager, that was very bothersome to him. But really, it was a game changer because they lowered the radiation grade as a result of that. In the next slide, you'll see Isaac again. Uh, this is my wife, Daisha. And, you know, when the chemotherapy drugs were administered, Isaac had a lot of pain, a lot of appetite. What was amazing was for this, the eight months that he was there during treatment, during the chemotherapy, uh, he didn't lose a pound of weight and he ate maybe a child's portion of food the entire time. And it's because St. Jude two or three times a week would mix up his, uh, look at his blood and do labs on the blood. And then they would mix up, they call it TPN, which is total parental nutrition, like lick uh, uh, a liquid nutrition that would be infused through a line in his chest. And that's how he got his food and the nutrients that he needed. And as a result, he didn't need anything, but he never lost any weight because of that being done. In the next picture here, you see Isaac. There were times where, uh, you know, here he is playing cards with his mom, you know, and I, I noted here that over the course of 10 years, he spent over one year in the hospital uh, so we, we know the hospital well. With the cancer treatment and the radiation, what we noticed was, uh, you know, Isaac having this tumor removed, the fine motor skills were something that had to be continually worked on to, uh, and you can see in the next photo of him with a big um, therapy ball that he's working with the therapist on here. And he would sit on that ball and try to balance himself, which was very difficult. Uh, because of his loss of balance. He also, during physical therapy, they would take him outside and he would shoot uh, shoot baskets, which was very hard for him. He, he didn't know how to hold the ball, and then it was hard for him to shoot the ball. Also, they took him, you know, walking, taking stairs. They, of course, always looked at his strength and his extremities and his hands and his feet uh, because of the loss of balance in those areas. And then also his feet were a big concern as well because of the chemotherapy causing nerve damage in his legs. And in the next photo, you can see Isaac here. He's working with the therapist. You can see the, the scars on the front of his head where uh, part of the tumor were removed. But part of, you know, uh, you know, you know, here he had to learn how to hold a fork and a spoon because he would grab it like a fork. And then they put pegs in a board and they would time him and they were looking at you know, the fine motor in his hands and walking on the stairs. In the next picture, I wrote a whole chapter in the book about this. It's called Prison Rules. And you can't see it in this picture, but because of the nerve damage the chemotherapy drugs would cause in his legs, he had to wear braces on his legs, which he hated to wear. But if he didn't wear those, the, the nerves would be permanently damaged. And so to keep him from being in a wheelchair for life, he had to wear these braces. And then when he was out of the braces, he was in a wheelchair. But there was a time during physical therapy, we were, the uh, person brought out um, hockey sticks. And we were uh, getting ready to play hockey. And uh, of course, Isaac didn't want to play and he, he just barely hit the putt back. And we had saw in a movie one time, I said, Isaac, how about we play by prison rules? And so he said, are you serious? And and so he smashed the puck at me as hard as he could. And then I smashed it back at him. And the therapist yelled, what are prison rules? And Isaac said, it means there are no rules. And we laughed about that. But for him, that was a real turning point because, you know, he, it really inspired him to do the stretches and get well and to end the pain of cancer. In the next picture, you see a picture of him. 
in a wheelchair. And when he wasn't wearing the leg braces, and those were hard to walk in, but he wore those during therapy. He wore those at night. That was to keep his foot from dropping and the nerves and the muscles being permanently stretched down. But th going throughout the hospital, a lot of times he was in a wheelchair because it was easier to get around. In the next picture, you see a picture of Isaac here. Oh, uh, you know, St. Jude does a lot of marketing and we allowed his story to be used in their marketing. Here, Isaac is being interviewed for a story. He's not really one that really liked that too much. When I was there, I did a lot of speaking at corporate events. Uh, Fortune 500 companies would come in and bring their CEOs and workers, and St. G would have banquets for them, and I would share our story with them. Isaac also, he, he loved basketball, and he met a lot of NBA stars when he was in Memphis. And he was also, in 2011, the NBA Child of the Year, which meant we allowed them to use his story, and they – you know, market it through the arenas. They would put a story. Uh, St. Jude, you know, is a, has a big partnership with the NBA because of the Grizzlies there. And his story was used in the NBA uh, marketing to raise an awareness and also raise funding for the hospital. In the next picture here, you see my wife, Daisha, and my son, Caleb. And, you know, I, I tell people, you know, when a family, when someone in the family suffers cancer, an entire family is thrust into a state of chaos. You have not only the person suffering from cancer, but you have two parents that have to leave their jobs for almost a year and go to Memphis. And so I, Caleb's godparents took care of him. That's Caleb there with my wife. But we didn't have any family in Tulsa. Our nearest family was in Kansas. And so Caleb was able to stay in school and stay with his godparents here. Our neighbors took care of our pets and mowed our yard for us while we were gone. They also did fundraising, even though St. Jude didn't charge us anything for the medical uh, component of what the insurance didn't pay. We had the cost of travel back and forth, uh, keeping our home, you know, in Sepulpa, we still had mortgage payments to make. Um, you know, it, it was a very, very difficult time and we couldn't have done it without the support of our family. And the next picture here, some of you may recognize this. Uh, this is at the Blue City Cafe on Beale Street. And a story behind this, this is Kevin Durant. At the time he played for the Thunder, I think he's with the Brooklyn Nets now in professional basketball. But we had Isaac, at the time the NBA was on strike and Kevin Durant and LeBron James and several players were in Memphis at, for a charity game. Uh, that one of the players had arranged and Isaac wanted to go to the game, but the doctor had told him your blood counts are too low. It's not safe for you to go. And so Isaac um, didn't get to go to the game, but we went to uh, Beale Street and one of the waiters there uh, told Isaac, you know, there's someone here that wants to meet you. And it was like the entire wait staff gathered around where Isaac, you know, met his childhood idol stood up. He was in, in town for the game and signed a bunch of autographs. And I remember when he looked at Isaac and he saw the large scar on his head, his words were, it's not fair. He's only a kid. And that really stuck with me because it made a big impression on him to see Isaac, uh, you know, bald, 13 years old, going through cancer. In the next picture here, some of you maybe are a part of this, maybe volunteer or run the race yourself. This is at the St. Jude Marathon. And I, we were kind of, this was on the campus of St. Jude. I'm told I've never run the marathon. I volunteered for it one year, but they start downtown and I guess they run through the campus of St. Jude and a lot of the families will come out and line the, the street as they run through. My wife here is holding a sign. This is Isaac, 14 years old, brain cancer survivor. Thank you. There would be runners coming up to us and they would hug us and start crying. Some would give us their wristbands. For them, it was just so emotionally moving to be running, you know, this race and to run through the hospital and then to see children, you know, kids like Isaac in a wheelchair suffering from brain cancer. And for a lot of them, it was a very moving experience. And for us as well to feel the love and compassion of these strangers coming and running through and showing their compassion towards us. And the next picture, Isaac, after a year, was released to go home. We actually flew home, and so Isaac here is being welcomed home.
by his friends at the airport. Here's another picture here. After he got home, uh, Isaac will tell you that the hardest thing was not going through cancer, but it was returning home to a normal world that didn't know what he had been through. And when you're a child like this and you're in public and you take off your hat, he, he said, you know, immediately people would stare at you. And what was really difficult for me when I was writing this book, for nine months, uh, Isaac didn't want to say anything to me about the book. And I really wanted to interview him and get, you know, his thoughts and his feelings. <laughs> and at the time, he was living in Memphis. He was working at St. Jude at the time in the IT department. And he called me up and said, Dad, I got something I want to say. And so I drove down there and I, I got out a recorder and I tape recorded them and I said, I'll ask questions and you answer them and then I'll write them out and then you edit it. And the first thing he said was, when I came home, I wanted to die. And he said, I went into a world that didn't understand what I'd been through. I, even though people didn't say a word to me, I could tell they stared at me. He said, I went to school and I felt like a stranger in a familiar place where I knew these kids for my entire life, but I felt like I was a stranger in a place that I knew so well. That was really hard for me to hear as a parent, you know, that coming home, he wanted to die. In the next picture here, you can see, you know, the, the awkward smile that he had. Um, when he came home, you know, eventually his hair grew back, which covered up the scars that he had during surgery. But what happened was, you know, his face, you know, even his eyebrow would not move on the left side. And that left side of his face, when he smiled, one side would go up. So when Isaac, you know, graduated from high school a few years later after coming home in the next slide, slide 32. Uh, when he graduated from high school, he was actually on the AB honor roll. He was in the top 25% of his class. He received a scholarship to a technical uh, school to study internet security. And you can see when he, when he tries to control a smile, uh, you know, one side of the face will stay, it'll all stay level. But a spontaneous smile, like in the next picture with Juana McCoy, which we'll all talk about, you can definitely see that one side of the face moves and the other side does not. And so St. Jude told us they have a procedure they could do my wife thought this next photo is a little bit too graphic, but in slide 34, they actually took nerves from the back of his legs that went all the way up to his, all the way up to his knee that worked the pinky toe. And they took these nerve tissues and they moved him, moved them to the paralyzed side of the face. They, in the next picture, you can see a picture of him after surgery where they Actually, you can see the little holes below the nose. That's where they took nerves. And they connected it to the, the working side of the face, and they brought those nerves to the paralyzed side. And then they went under the chin and then under the mouth. And the goal of the surgery was to pull the face up where it wouldn't sag. And in the next picture, you can see him. This is him on a plate. Ultimately, the surgery, that was the first part of the surgery. The second part of the surgery was to take muscle from his thigh and graft it to the paralyzed side of the face. It's called the smile surgery. And in Isaac's case, uh, it got very complicated. The muscle began to bleed. They took him into surgery. The surgeon said he actually died on the operating table. He had an allergic reaction to a drug and uh, had to be revived during surgery. It, it took a surgery that was supposed to take an hour and a half took seven. And it really reminded me that all surgery carries risk. Even this one that wasn't cancer related per se, uh, but it carried an enormous amount of risk. And so, uh, you know, after, you know, Isaac's, uh, I think his last surgery was three years ago. And so his face, that side of the face still doesn't, when he smiles, still doesn't go up and the eyebrow doesn't move. He's learned to kind of control his smile where um, if he doesn't want people to notice, he'll, he'll not smile spontaneously. But as I close out, you know, here I wrote stories of 13 different people that came into our life during our, our time in Memphis. Some of these people were complete strangers. Some of them were friends and family from home, but they had a profound impact on our life. And what I didn't know is sometimes we had a profound impact on them. 
In slide 37, Isaac was a huge fan of the Oklahoma City Thunder. And one time in Memphis, he was well enough, and we went to a ball game where the Memphis Grizzlies were playing the Thunder. And before the game, I went down to try to get a player uh, to come up and meet Isaac in the arena. He was too weak to walk down to the down to the floor. And of course, the players kind of all zone out. They're not paying attention to the fans. But I recognized Brian Davis, who was the announcer of the team. And Brian had been with the NFL. He announced hockey games, college games. And he came up in the arena and met Isaac. And he told me uh, several years later, you know, that meeting Isaac was really a turning point in his life. He said, when I saw what you guys went through and saw the, the suffering and how Isaac, you know, dealt with it, he said it, it didn't penetrate my heart. It didn't break my heart. He said it penetrated it. Isaac was an inspiration to me. And he said, you know, being in the NBA, I'm gone a lot. And he said it really changed my my life in, towards, in terms of how I view family and was a real turning point in his life as a result of meeting Isaac. And the second picture, and the next picture, slide 38, you can see um, Nate Tibbetts. At the time we met him, he was with the Thunder. This was after we returned home, and you can see Isaac's spontaneous smile there again. Uh, he was with the Cleveland Cavaliers, and we didn't know it at the time, but when we met Nate Tibbetts, he would tell me years later that two years prior to meeting us, he lost his dad to cancer. And he told me his dad was his best friend. His dad was his coach in high school. Uh, his dad, you know, when he went on to play college ball, his dad came to every game. When he coached in college, his dad would watch every game and they would talk after the game about the different players and the strategies. And then he said, when I went into the NBA minor leagues, my dad, same thing. He would watch every game after every game I would call him and discuss the game. But then he died of colon cancer at age 58. And he said, it really destroyed my life. And he said, I was so angry and bitter as a result of that. And then I met Isaac and I saw the resilience that he had and what he went through. And he said it really made a huge impact on my life and brought healing to my life as a result of meeting Isaac and seeing what his, uh, seeing what he, how he had handled the cancer in his life. My next slide here uh, is Juana McCoy, which someone, uh, many of you know, works in the library. And the interesting thing about Juana, we, Juana, uh, you know, she has a therapy dog. I think Lila has passed away uh, in the last year. And we met Juana McCoy. We were at a Walgreens on McLean and um, uh, not Poplar, but one, uh, McLean and one of those streets there near near the Target house. We were in there and I, I gave the clerk our credit card. And at the time they asked for a zip code. And of course, it was an out of state zip code. And then Juana came up to me. She was behind me in line and she said, I'm, I want to help you. She said, I'm I'm retired or I, I'm, I'm a, I live here in Memphis. Do you know anyone here? And we said, no. And she said, here's my phone number. And she said, I want your number. And I felt kind of awkward giving a stranger my phone number, someone that I had never met before. But she said, I want to be here for you. I want to help your family. You know, you're in Memphis. You're by yourself. You're, uh, you know, you're going through cancer. It was about three days later, I met Juana for lunch at Central Barbecue near uh, the University of Memphis, my favorite place to eat. And then we left there and Juana came to the hospital and met Isaac for the first time. She said it was the first time she'd actually been on the campus of St. Jude. But over the course of the next nine months, Juana became like family to us. Isaac had lost both of his grandmothers to, can uh, to cancer. And so Juana would come and stay with Isaac in the hospital if Daisha and I were busy or one of us was back out of town, maybe doing something with her other son. Juana was the one we called upon to come and stay with him in the hospital. And when I interviewed Juana for this book and I, I wrote a whole chapter about her, she, she told a story where she was in the hospital and a doctor came and said, Juana, uh, or a doctor came in the room and said, Isaac, who is this uh, lady here with you? And without hesitation, Isaac just looked up and said, it's my grandma. And Juana said that just meant the world to her. But I wrote these stories of 13 different people like this to 
reinforce the belief that you can be the miracle in someone else's life. You don't have to be the doctor. You don't have to be the surgeon. You don't have to be the nurse. You can be like Juana McCoy, a complete stranger that comes to a family and meets them at their greatest time of need and becomes a family member that you call upon during some of the darkest days of cancer. You know, every time we go back to Memphis, we always make a point to go see Juana. I talk to her regularly. She's become family to us. And it's just a remarkable story of someone who was a complete stranger that wanted to help, was very persistent, by the way, and became a family member to us during Memphis. In the final slide, this is our present day family. Uh, a lot of people ask, uh, you know, Caleb, he's got shorter hair now, but Isaac worked for two years at St. Jude after he graduated from high school. He actually went to a technical school here, got a degree in internet security, but it was during the COVID crisis where he decided he wanted to come home because he was in, he was basically quarantined off the campus. And I, I think in a lot of ways, he went to work there because at St. Jude, no one would stare at you. Uh, he was the miracle of St. Jude. And I think for him, it was easier to, he felt acceptance there. Whereas in a normal world, he felt like people stared at him and looked at his smile, kind of looked at him like he was a damaged child when he first got home. Our younger brother, Caleb, graduated and he actually uh, works in HVAC or heat and air. He works for a large Tulsa firm that specializes in skyscrapers and arenas. He's got a really good job. My wife, Daisha, also retired the year before I did, and she works as a relationship banker here at a local bank. I retired a year ago, and I had plans to move into a consulting role with St. Jude, which I still feel like that's a definite possibility. I know the CEO there. The leadership team at the hospital has read my book, and uh, they're aware of it. I wanted their blessing on it. And in the final slide, you'll see the brain cancer ribbon. It's supposed to be a gray ribbon, but below it, I listed, you know, kind of his medical history, which Isaac had 21 surgeries overall, and the longest surgery was 25 hours. He had 31 treatments of experimental radiation to the brain and spine. The four experimental rounds of chemotherapy where three drugs were doubled at double or normal dose. Four stem cell transplants were his own bone marrow. They harvested those stem cells and gave it back to him. 125 blood transfusions. 360 nights spent in the hospital. Uh, three times during treatment, he almost uh, uh, succumbed to the ills of cancer, almost died during treatment. You know, part of the miracle of St. Jude, like I told you, was that, you know, because of the, the experimental radiation, the therapies were so much more advanced. Isaac suffered no brain damage as a result. He's able to drive a car. He's able to live on his own like a normal child. He didn't have any nerve damage in his legs because of the braces that he wore and the wheelchairs he was in and the intense physical therapy. He does struggle with balance some, but it's getting better over time. He did have a slight hearing loss, but St. Jude was able to give him an experimental drug during therapy to prevent that hearing loss. And then last but not least, you know, he takes one drug over the counter for cancer treatment. After all these surgeries, you would think that he would be taking drugs for seizures and all of that. All that he takes is over-the-counter vitamin D. That's it as a result of all this treatment at St. Jude. And then not, I think the best news of all for us, now that he's reached the 10-year milestone being out from cancer, his survival rate is 97%. And compared to what we were facing back in the beginning with this massive tumor and the brain damage, and not being able to walk or ever hear again. St. Jude, and that's why I wanted the, the cover of the book to reflect someone longing for the miracle on the other side. Through the grace of God and St. Jude, Isaac is with us today, but also lives a relatively normal life. He now works at Amazon, of all things, in Tulsa. And he comes home and he tells us he walked 15 miles today on that warehouse floor. He's really a testament to St. Jude and the miracle uh, that St. Jude plays in the lives of so many children there. I think that's, do I have one more slide, uh, Wan Ying? That was the last slide. Okay, I wanted to, you know, if any of you have any questions for me, uh, 
a lot of you maybe know people in Memphis, uh, know something about the hospital. I wanted to leave some time here, the last five or 10 minutes for questions or comments from you. Well, what I would say is that, Tom, thank you so much for this wonderful, inspirational and motivational story. It truly says, you, you know, this, uh, um, the courage that uh, Isaac being through overcoming uh, all these challenges and difficulties and the sacrifice your family has been through. And it's just astounding to us. It's amazing to 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 hear. And also this also give us a renew all and respect for the amazing work St. Jude doctors, researchers, clinical caregivers, all they do to 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 realize the mission of St. Jude, which is to finding cures and saving children's lives. That is sure. just absolutely wonderful. I it's amazing too. The doctors there come from all over the world. It's not just doctors from the United States, but like I said, our lead doctor was from um, India. And we had other doctors, you know, from the Middle East or Africa. They come from all over the world, the best surgeons, doctors, researchers in the world. Even though we maybe saw 10 or 12 doctors during our time there, they told us there was 60 to 70 doctors researching Isaac's case behind the scenes that we never met. That's how specialized the care at the hospital is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anyone else have any questions um, or comments for Tom? I have one more, Tom. I know that I read the book, um, and the, in the book you said that, uh, um, and also today you also mentioned that um, Isaac felt that when he went back to, to his normal life, he felt the most difficulty part is the people stare. They didn't know what he has been through. And uh, also you mentioned about Juana being your guardian angel. For yes. Memphis, we live in Memphis. We actually do see a lot of these uh, uh, St. Jude children and their families. What will be, um, what from a perspective of a parent of a patient, what do you want us, because sometimes we don't know what to behave or what to ask or what to do. So what would you say, give us advice, what would be best to for us to show empathy and also to show um, um, to show things that's the appropriate things to do? You know, uh, that's a great question, Wang Ying. And something that, you know, was special about Juana, when you're going through something like this, you long for normalcy. And, uh, you know, when Isaac, you know, was going through all of this when he was well enough, we would go over to Juana's house and maybe and her son. And you long for the normalcy of being in a house and being around uh, people that are, are not sick with cancer because it, it gives you hope that maybe your life will be normal again. Because you know, when you're at St. Jude, you're in a hospital bed all the time, and then you're in an apartment with all the hookups and all the gear. Uh, you long for normalcy. And so anything you can do uh, to give a person normalcy, I know you, uh, St. Jude, you know, when there's a lot of museums that offer free admission for St. Jude families, we took advantage of that going to the zoo, even riding on the trolley back when the trolley was operating. Uh, we, we would ride the trolley a lot and go different places. So really just giving families anything to give them a sense of normalcy in their lives to take, take kind of their minds off the pain and hurt of cancer. I don't think that's a very detailed answer, uh, but that's really all I can think of at the moment. That's very good because the library, as library, we give um, um, extra, I think, educational kind of checkout privileges for central patients. Normally people can check out 25 bucks, I believe for central patients. Um, Josh, you may correct me if I'm wrong or other library staff. I think for central patients, you can check out up to 50 items at one time. Oh, wow. Yeah, I didn't know that at the time. That would have been wonderful. We probably would have come in the library and just had a, a place to sit and read. Uh, just to, because, you know, you spend hours and hours in the hospital and then you go to an apartment and just reminds you of, uh, of just the pain of cancer and what you're going through. Yes, Henrietta just confirmed that said I was correct. For St. Jude patients, you have a special privilege. It's called the educator's privilege that you can check out twice as month of uh, items from the library at one time than average people. 
anybody else have anything to ask Tom? And I know that uh, um, one of the things that many of you probably participate for me personally, I participate in the past several years, um, the St. Jude 5K walk and run to fundraise. And that was always really fun. And it's amazed to see so many people, not only just from Memphis, but from around the country or even around the world come to participate in the St. Jude half, half marathon or, or, or 5K run and walk in September and December. Yeah, I was there two years ago for the walk. That was really special to just see thousands of people turn out and even the marathon people come from all over the world really to join, to be a part of that event. It was really special to be a part of that. Do you mind me sharing one story that um, I, um, I just want to share a story of uh, myself as an uh, interpreter for, for one of the Chinese uh, patient there? Sure, wonderful. Okay, um, I um, interpreted all together for three um, three Chinese patients uh, and their families, and um, I don't know the other one, but one of the three uh, is a ten year was a ten year old girl who was very brave, just like Isaac um, was um, having um, bone marrow transplant uh, and. Um, one thing is that uh, she was um, an artist. So uh, at one point when she and her parents were having a conference with the doctor trying to uh, work out the plan and protocol of treatment and have a very serious discussion and she really wanted to have the second bone marrow transplant and they were discussing on that. And at that conference, it was between me, I was the interpreter for the parents and the child and also the doctor and uh, and the, some of the researchers uh, were there talking. And she gave, um, I'm not sure what I, I, my camera is on. Can you see it? I cannot see it myself. Yeah, can you can. see I'm holding up something? Yeah. Okay, this is something that I kept till this day. And this, she's an artist, so she made this miniature cake. Um, this is a miniature cake in a little box and it's been several years and you can see this cake is still there it's a miniature cake she gave this box of small cakes to the doctor to the researcher and to me as the interpreter and she would just say that um, she was a very smart talented young lady and very brave um and she said that um um she said that i want to give this cake to you guys and um, um and I want to share this is the miniature cake, our cake, uh, artwork of a cake, and I hope all children live life, live their lives as sweet as this cake, without pediatric cancer, chemotherapy, radiation, and suffering. And then when she gave this to me, of course I kept it till this day. And also she said that uh, when she gave this to her doctor, and her doctor says something very eloquent. Of course, I cannot re remember what he said. It was very profound and eloquent. But basically, he, the doctor said, I'll put this cake on my desk in my office to remind me every day of my mission in St. Jude that one day all children's lives, 100% of the children's lives will be saved. Not 80%, but 100% of the lives will be saved. And it was so profound. And uh, I, of course, don't experience this every day. So I was just crying with tears all over and couldn't continue with my interpretation. But I was the only one crying. Everyone else was so brave in the room. And it was one of the best experiences for me I never forgot. That's wonderful. That's really neat for you to share that, Wang Ying. Thank you. I'd like to say something. Am, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Tom, thank you so much for coming back. We didn't have enough of you last time when you joined us. And <laughs> I would like to say, you know, being from Memphis, oh, we have a tendency to look at, some people have a tendency to look at St. Jude as part of the landscape. We know it's important and critical, but right. part of the landscape. Yeah. Now that you've been on for the last over an hour sharing Isaac's journey, when I think about St. Jude from now on, it's going to be more personal. Sure. And I have a little bracelet on here that has a St. Jude charm. And when I wear this bracelet, and I mean this, it's going to be also in honor of Isaac and his journey 
in St. Well, Jude. Very, so very thank kind you today. so much for just implanting that memory from such an intimate way into, into our psyches. That's very kind of you. I'm very touched by that. Thank you very much. It's very, very moving. Thank you, Elnora. That was so sweet. That was wonderful. To say. You know, and Elora, it's Elora, right? Elnora. Elnora, yes. That means a lot to me because, you know, as I, Isaac said, you know, I went into a world who didn't understand what I went through. And for you to wear a bracelet and think of him and what he's been through, every person that I've met who've had cancer said that it's not something you're ever cured of. You survive it. And then you learn to live your life with the disabilities and the handicaps the treatment leaves behind. And so that it's very moving and very touching of you to do that because he still faces challenges that any person who survived cancer does. And I, I remember coming back and then every three months going back for treatment and I would always get nervous about would the scan reveal a return of the cancer because they told us no one's ever lived through a relapse. We knew one little boy who his hair all came back and he had a relapse and one tumor became 32 down the brain and spine, they were everywhere and died within two weeks. And so uh, that's very touching and thank you very much for sharing that. So I have one more question, um, Tom. I know that in the book you talk about um, um, in solidarity with um, Isaac, you shave your hair. <laughs> <laughs> So right. now, does I saw in the picture in the later part of your family picture that Isaac does have the hair grow back, and you still have sure. not. You know, I, I tell people, at the time I cut my hair very very short, and he was upset about. I had to actually get a razor out and shave his head because the the hair was just falling out everywhere, and then he was crying. He was really upset. So I said, "Well, I'll shave mine too. You know, we'll both be bald," and. I grew it back out and then I had a bald spot in the front and then another one in the back. So I thought, I'm just going to keep the bald look. I'll get a tan look up there and I'll just keep it. So, uh, but yeah, his hair has grown back. It's kind of thinning on the top like an older person would where he had a boost of radiation. Uh, but he, you know, you look at him now and he's just the miracle of St. Jude, the $5 million miracle uh, of just the dedication of the, the, and I tell people, you know, it's not just the doctors and the nurses, but in the fundraising division, there's 3,000 people that work there all throughout the United States and the world raising money to make this happen. And so it's it's more than just health care. It's meeting the needs of a family in every way during treatment. Absolutely. Absolutely. So any anybody else have any questions or comments for Tom? Well, Tom, um, I really appreciated your, um, you turn that on, so. Tom, I really appreciated you and your wife and sharing your story because I know for a family to go through all of this, it took a lot of prayer and strength and courage for you. Sure. and. I really do admire you a lot. My family, my children live in Tulsa. My son and his, some of his children live in Tulsa. So I'm going to tell them about you and uh, your journey in, if they don't know. And uh, you're a wonderful spokesperson for St. Jude. You. And I, I hope for Isaac, as he is continuing on his journey, that um that each day he will he will think well i have done i have been able to accomplish this with the support of my family and the medical team and 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 i am thankful and grateful and he he i know probably has some uh down times some discouraging times but that he will keep on because he's, he has meant so much to many people, especially now that you've written this book and so many people are knowing more about him. So thank you for coming and being with us today. I'm glad you're a part of Memphis so often. And we just are uh, thankful for you. 
Well, thank you. And I'm looking forward to the day I told Wang Ying when you guys meet in person and I can come and meet you all in person. So, Oh, I'm me so too. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Group and with the work that I'm wanting to do now with the consulting, I'll have the time to do that. You know, one thing when I sent this book to the executives at St. Jude, I sent a draft to them. They said what really they learned a lot from was Isaac sharing about his experience and about, you know, how you know, he looked back and he reflected on treatment, how he had to adapt and come to kind of like you talked about the, the struggles in life as a recovering cancer patient. They learned a lot from that story. So that's neat of you to mention that because they mentioned that as well. Wow. The executives at the hospital did. Uh, mm-hmm. So thank you so much, Tom. I really well, thank appreciate you. It. It's been an honor to speak with you all today. I've been looking forward to it. That is wonderful. That is wonderful. If you all can just let me um, take this uh, last several minutes to talk about, I put two more pictures on his. Pro- we have two more wonderful uh, programs that's uh, coming up. One is um, on, on Thursday, next Thursday, I think it's May 27th from 6 to 8 p.m. is um, we're going to do a virtual watch party to watch a documentary film called Far East, Deep South. It's a film screening, screening to celebrate May, which is the Asian American Pacific Island Heritage Month which City of Memphis, uh, Library, Nike, and Chinese community all get together to this virtual watch party. Um, and then we will have a Q&A session with the filmmakers of this uh, documentary film. Oh. And this documentary film actually is showing um, on PBS around the country in the months of May right now. But we're going to watch together and then have a Q&A session with the director and the filmmaker, um, filmmakers of the film. And this is so unique because uh, even though it's showing nationally, it is a local story. It's Mississippi Delta story. So I personally know several people in the film. And uh, Josh, you actually have uh, done a program with the director and the filmmaker several years ago when they were coming here in the Miss South. Baldwin Chu and Larissa Lamb, if you still don't uh, still remember or not. But that will be um, May 27th from 6 to um, 6 to um, 8 p.m. So that is one thing uh, that's happening. And then for our next month's Books and Beyond, um, in June, Books and Beyond, um, Tuesday, June 15th at 10.15 to 11.30th, we will have another wonderful national speaker, um, author of uh, the uh, the Living Room is a lung cancer community of courage. She lives in California and uh, she um, um, wrote a book and she became the national director of this organization. Um, but she will also have some local um, special guests. Uh, you can see this Save the Day join Bonnie and Ariel to celebrate the release of The Living Room, the Lung Cancer Community of Courage on um, June 15th at 10.15 our time and the local um, uh, an oncologist from Baptist Cancer Center, Dr. Raymond, I don't know how to pronounce this last name and I don't want to butcher it either, but save the day for our next June um, Books and Beyond. And then in July, we will have uh, a vacation time, so we will not have Books and Beyond. And afterwards in August, you will read a book on your own. And that is our next two or three months planning for Books and Beyond. Um, with that said, I think do you any anyone has anything else to add? If not, we just want to thank Tom again for this wonderful uh, sharing you. of this story, and I hope all of you have a wonderful day and enjoy the rest of the day, and then keep reading and keep sharing story. Thank you so much for joining us today. We'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.